I'm preaching this morning on a new series called uh, Living uh, Peacefully in a Turbulent World. And I'll tell you how this started. When, about a month ago, I was working on my Christmas Eve service sermon and this January series, both at the same time. And all of a sudden, I realized that my Christmas Eve sermon could really be the start of a series for January. And those of you that were here at 6.30, I gave you a little bit of a warning that some of this would be redundant. We're going to do the first part of that Christmas Eve service to get us started. And then we're going to move in a direction that I hope will guide us throughout the rest of the year. So the series is Living Peacefully, uh, Be Not Afraid, Living Peacefully in a Turbulent World. Today I'm going to talk about more or less about making peace with God, I think is a good way of putting it. Next week we're going to talk about living peacefully, making peace on an everyday basis, the small acts that we can do that make a difference in the world. The following week we'll talk about when hard times come, when you have tough times in your own life and how you find peace and move forward that time. Alice McKenzie will be here on the last Sunday of the month and she's going to preach on a powerful topic, making peace with yourself. So I think it's going to be a great series, and we're going to learn together as we move through on this, and you'll hear more about that in a moment. Let me invite you to find your Bible, if you brought it, or a pew Bible, or you can look on the screens. The 14th chapter of John is very, very rich. It's a very famous chapter, uh, but I'm only going to read this one verse to keep us focused, and then we're going to come back and talk about the context in just a moment. Jesus has the disciples gathered around him. And he knows that this is one of the last conversations he will have with them. This is towards the end of his life. And this is what he says to them. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled. What powerful words. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A couple of months ago, I was at Siete Ranch. That's my little 40-acre retreat. I have about an hour north of here. We've got a couple of horses up there and just a handful of cows. And it's a wonderful place for me to go and relax and, and retreat. I was up there with my seven-year-old grandson, Liam. He calls me Dee Dee, and I, I refer to that every now and then. It's short for Daddy Don, Dee Dee. And so we needed to vaccinate some cows on this particular day. So I had about five cows and a big 1,600-pound bull in this small pen and I was going to move them into a chute so we could vaccinate them. Liam was with me and this is the kind of work we do all the time at CIT Ranch. It's really not dangerous if you do it properly, but just to be safe, I didn't want him to get stepped on. So just to be safe, I had Liam step outside of the pen till we got that bull in the chute. Everything went well, we got the cows vaccinated, got them moved out into the pasture. But when when we got back in the truck to head back to the barn, Liam looked up at me and he said, Dee Dee, is there anything that you're afraid of at all? Now listen, this is the, you may not be there yet, you may not be a grandfather yet, but I assure you, this is the kind of moment that grandfathers live for. (laughs) At the moment that our sons have discovered how truly fallible and vulnerable we are, they don't pay attention to us at all. They've completely destroyed the myth of invincibility. Along comes a new generation willing to look up at us and say, Dee Dee, are you afraid of anything? Willing to buy into the myth that we are, in fact, invincible. Well, I was tempted. I mean, I confess I was tempted. I, I really thought about saying, well, you know, Liam, after all these many years, I faced down so many big bulls and cows and so forth. I'm really not afraid of anything. I decided to tell him the truth. I said, Liam... I'm scared of many things, and I will always be scared of many things. It's okay to be scared. The important thing in life is to learn how to deal with your fear. Now, I thought that was a good and wise wise answer. But guess what? It's not what the Bible tells us, not what the Bible tells us at all. So we're still in the season of Christmas. We will be for the next two days. Wednesday is the day of Epiphany. We have the Feast of Epiphany. So this is what, the 10th day of Christmas or whatever. And so let me just remind you about what you find in that Christmas story. You open the Gospel of Luke to the very first chapter and you find the story of Zechariah, who is married to a woman named Elizabeth who will become the father of John the Baptist. 
And he's in the temple praising God, and he has this kind of spiritual experience in which he is told the news about Elizabeth, who is in her old age, is going to become pregnant with a child. And the first thing that the angel says to him is, Zechariah, be not afraid. Be not afraid. Didn't say handle your fear. It just says, don't be afraid. And then you turn over to the first chapter of Matthew and you find the story of uh, Joseph, the father, the, the husband of Mary. And he has a dream and he's probably trying to dream about, you know, his future wedding and all of that. But in this dream, the angel comes to him and tells him that his wife is pregnant and he wonders how. But the first thing the angel says to him is, Joseph, do not be afraid. You turn back to the first chapter of Luke. I'm trying to go in chronological order here. The first chapter of Luke, and there's the story of Mary. The angel Gabriel appears to her and says she's going to have a child, and it won't be by Joseph. But the first thing the angel says is, be not afraid. And then that wonderful passage we all read on Christmas Eve from the second chapter of Luke, where Mary and Joseph are out there with the baby in the stable, and and the shepherds are up in the hills, and all of a sudden the, the skies light up, singing angels. And we're told that the shepherds were afraid, and the angel says, the angel Gabriel says to them, be not afraid, for unto you is born this night in the city of David a Savior. It's fascinating. The Bible is consistent and redundant and unambiguous about this. We're not supposed to be afraid at all, at all. Interestingly, you can turn to the back of each one of the four Gospels, the stories of Jesus, and read about the resurrection, and you'll see this experience mirrored entirely. At every point at which they discover that Jesus has been resurrected, the disciples and other followers were afraid. And at every point, an angel or the risen Christ himself says, do not be afraid. In the Old and New Testament together, there are 365 passages which say something to the effect of, do not be afraid, do not be anxious. The Bible is utterly consistent and powerful on this particular subject. We are supposed to live life with no fear whatsoever. It is a remarkable message. The question is, how do we do that in a world as scary as the one that you and I live in. And I don't need to do this today. I don't need to start listing all of the things that are going on in our country and in the Middle East and in the Far East and uh, in the Ukraine, the things that we could be afraid of. I don't need to start listing all of the crises that beset us at one time or another. But you're probably going through one of some kind or another now, and you probably have a, a bit of anxiety or fear. We live in a remarkably, a remarkably fearful world. And so how does the believer, the person of faith, meet the challenge of living without fear in a very scary and a very turbulent world? When we turn to this 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, I'm going to set the context now. Jesus has gathered the disciples around him, and it's kind of a farewell speech. Jesus knows that he's headed for the cross. It won't be long. And these are his final instructions to the disciples. And he talks about the fact that he's getting ready to leave, and he's going to be going to his father's heavenly mansion. And there's a passage that perhaps you've heard read a lot at funerals. He says, in my father's house are many rooms, and I go to prepare a place for you. So what he's talking about here is the fact that not only is he going to be leaving, but he's talking about the fact that uh, God will write the final passage, the final chapter in life. He talks about the fact that God is in me, I'm in God. That's reminiscent of the prologue of John, the very first verses of John, which is really the Christmas story for John. So he reminds the disciples in a roundabout way that it was God who created the world, God who breathed life into them. He reminds them that God will write the final chapter in life. And then he reminds them, or he really announces something else to them, a very powerful moment. He talks about the presence of the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm leaving, but God will send someone else. Your Bible translates this in different ways. Perhaps it says the Holy Spirit, or it says an advocate for you. But basically, Jesus is saying that when I go to heaven, God will still be present to you. My spirit will still be present to you in the form of the Holy Spirit. 
And so these are the three promises of Jesus in his, uh, one of his last uh, moments with the disciples. That God created the world out of love and God loves you. That God will write the final chapter, therefore you have no reason to fear. And that God will continue to be present with you and in your life until the end of times through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, if Jesus is right about all three of those things, and if you and I were to completely believe all three of those things, we would, in fact, live without any fear whatsoever. If Jesus was right, we completely believe that God created the world, that God will write the final chapter, and that God is with us in every moment of life. We would be able to live our lives entirely without fear. The problem is that we don't believe it. Not a single one of us believes it. Not you, not I, not, not a single one of us. We may believe it up here, but in terms of believing it down here with our whole being, committed to the truth of that with our whole being, not a single one of us believes that. Not completely. Okay, I, I want to be fair about this. Maybe you believe that completely. If there's someone out there who um, never has, if, you're, if you never have a moment where you experience fear or anxiety, if you never have a moment where you experience depression or sadness, then I'll give you credit. We'll take you off the list of church members and put you on the list of saints. <laughs> Let me tell you something. When you read about the lives of the saints, they all struggled with their doubts. And so let's talk about this. We live in what I like to call a binary word, world. Some of you, if you're a mathematician or a computer programmer or an engineer, you know what that word binary refers to. All of our computer code, I'm gonna sound like I'm an expert on this, but I really don't understand anything about it, but I, I can pretend like I know about it. All of our computer code is written with just two uh, symbols, zeros and ones. Every bit of information you get on your computer is, comes from a combination, a string of zeros and ones. That's it, just two. And so we live in a binary world, that's the way I like to talk about it, in which we could try to think either it's this way or it's that way. It's either black or it's white. It's either right or it's wrong. That's what I call a, 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 a binary world. And so this is what has led us to what I think is a great and powerful mistake in the way in which we talk about faith. We talk about faith in this way. We like to say either you have faith or, um, and if you have faith, you have no doubts. Or if you have doubts, you have no faith. And that is completely wrong. There's not a single person that I know of who has faith, but who has no doubts. And I happen to believe that most people who have doubts, even those who claim to be agnostic or atheists, also have faith. They're just not willing to claim it, or they don't understand it, or it's not strong enough for them to believe in it. So the question for us as Christians, if we have faith, but we also have doubts, the question for us or the challenge for us as Christians as we move through our spiritual journey is to learn how to reduce the impact, the number and the impact of doubts in our lives and to grow in our faith or to grow in our understanding and trusting of God in life. And that we can do. For a number of years, we've been very receptive. We've embraced people who have doubts in this church. We've said, if you're an agnostic or if you're an atheist, welcome to Christ Church. If you're on a spiritual journey, you're willing to learn and move forward, we want you to be a part of us. And that's more true than ever before. But what I think we have not done is it's done a good job of sharing with one another, both believers and non-believers, how it is we grow on our spiritual journey, how it is we grow more trust in God so that we can live 
with less fear. So as we move forward on this sermon series, we're going to be dealing with this off and on. The issue of doubt, we're going to be honest about it. We're going to be explicit about it. We're going to talk about how it is we uh, live lives faithfully, acknowledging our doubts, but becoming stronger in our trust. And so to introduce that part, let me just acquaint you with a phrase that I want you to remember. It is the, the two words, spiritual practice. Occasionally I'll say spiritual discipline. But the phrase is spiritual discipline or spiritual practice. And here's how I want you to think of this. If you are wanting to become better at creating a, an Excel spreadsheet, for instance, you would practice at it, wouldn't you? If you were wanting to become better at piloting an airplane, you would fly more often, you would practice at it, you would get a mentor perhaps. If you wanted to become better at running a marathon, you would practice. So if we want to become better and stronger in our faith, if we want to have fewer doubts and more faith, if we want to live with more powerful trust in our lives, the way to do it is with spiritual practice. And I'm going to introduce one idea for you this morning and encourage you to begin today. This is a New Year's resolution that you can easily keep. And that is to have one moment, at least one moment, of spiritual practice every single day. A few months ago, back in this fall, I think, I preached a three-sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. And I said, the least we can do is say the Lord's Prayer every single day. If you didn't hear that and you're interested, you can go back and you can listen to that sermon series. Because I kind of unpacked the richness of the Lord's Prayer. I think if you start learning what the Lord's Prayer actually says and does, then you'll want to say it every single day. So start there. Just simply saying the Lord's Prayer or a prayer every single day. And then you can grow from there. You can start uh, praying more or reading some scripture. Or you could try this. And I know this isn't intuitive for a lot of you. You could try 15 minutes of silence. You spend 15 minutes in silence, true silence. I like to do it in the darkness. You will experience the presence of God. Because ultimately, faith is not about what we know. Faith is about what we believe. And what we believe is often a matter of what we experience. So spiritual practice is taking the time to open yourself up to the experience of the presence of God. And if you will do that, sooner or later, you will experience God. And you will be de begin to grow in your spiritual life. We're going to help you. The season of Lent is not far off. In a couple of months, maybe seven or eight weeks, we're going to do something different in the season of Lent. I hope you'll seriously consider joining us for this service. Every Wednesday, rather than going to Trinity Hall, we're going to come in here on Wednesday evenings. We're going to come to a place where we experience the transcendence of God. There's a reason we built that ceiling so high. The transcendence of a creative God. Where we experience the beauty of God. There is a reason we commissioned these windows. Where we experience the presence of God on the inside. Through participating in ancient liturgies. Ancient spiritual practices that we have for the most part in the Methodist Church, church abandoned but which I believe can lead us deeper in our own spiritual practice and our own experience of the presence of God. And then, starting today, we open this table and we invite you to the oldest liturgy of them all, coming to the table of the Lord with one another. Now, it doesn't make any difference to me whatsoever what you believe when we say this is the body of Christ, this is the blood of Christ. There are old theological debates about transubstantiation, consubstantiation, all of those things. It doesn't make any difference to me what you believe when we say here's the bread, the body of Christ. Here's the wine, the blood of Christ. 
What matters is that you take a moment to experience the presence of Christ. And if you do, you will turn around and you will leave with a little more faith and a little less fear. And you will say, thanks be to God. Amen.